Hey guys, so like three years ago, I made a video that was very popular called Contemporary Techniques Part 1. And Part 1 implied that there would be a Part 2 coming soon. Uh, so soon is apparently now. <laughs> I apologize for the very lengthy delay, but life happens. Um, obviously, in the meantime, I have made a whole host of standalone videos about Contemporary Techniques. I will link both the Contemporary Techniques 101, which is performer-based, and the Contemporary Techniques for Composers, which is obviously composer-based, in the description. For those of you who haven't seen the first video, that one focused on kind of the more standard contemporary techniques, or at least the ones that were a little bit more concise. Um, this video is going to go through some ones that I wasn't sure how to talk about at the time, or didn't think I could talk about them in the time frame I was giving myself. Um, I didn't really want that video to be endless, though it was a very long video in the end. Um, so we're going to talk about some of the ones that are a little bit less standard and a little bit harder to explain today. Someone has asked me to talk about Skirino's flute techniques, and I think that's a great idea. I am not going to do that in this video, however. One, because there's a lot of them, and again, I don't want this video to be endless. And two, I really want to talk about Skirino's techniques by themselves, because as you guys probably have heard me talk about before, Skirino's flute techniques, while excellent and very cool and very usable, are very important to notate properly and carefully because Skirino is not necessarily a standard in the flute community. And while a contemporary specialist might know a lot about it, um, it's also possible that they've never played any of Skirino's music, so they don't know. And if you don't have a contemporary specialist playing your music, they might have absolutely no idea what you're talking about, and it's important to be able to give context. So, after that very long introduction, we're going to start with the first technique, which is breath tones, or air sounds, and within that there are a few subcategories. I've made both Contemporary Techniques 101 and Contemporary Techniques for Composers about this, so I have talked about this pretty much in depth, but it'll be here to be compiled with everything else. Um, so the first category is full air, no pitch. That sounds like this. And my preferred notation is this. You'll notice I'm saying preferred notation for most of these because they don't really have a standard notation. And this is just what I ask composers to do for me, but it's possible that other players are gonna ask for something else. Um, with this one, you will never get full noise, but you can distort the pitch enough that you really just hear air and not pitch. Uh, you'll notice I'm kind of rolling in the flute so that I'm not blowing directly over the tone hole, and that can help a little bit. And I also use a consonant syllable, in this case, SH, uh, to destroy the sound as well. Uh, the one thing I will say with this is that you do have to notate very clearly that you want noise. You do not want pitch because it's not a distinction that we're used to making usually. And also the sound is not really one that we're used to making outside of contemporary repertoire. With this one, I don't recommend notating a pitch because obviously you don't care. Um, like an empty note head or just a stem of a note with the proper air notation uh, is sufficient, at least to me, um, and can also help imply that you don't want an actual pitch. The next one is pitched full air. It sounds like this. And I'd prefer to see it notated like this. You'll see that my preferred notation is basically the same. This one, obviously you get pitch. Um, this one, it's easier to use kind of an F sound uh, and you don't necessarily want to give the flutist a syllable, um, but just really be, again, clear that you do want pitch. Obviously you do have to notate a pitch for this one. This technique falls prey to the flute physics problem where uh, the middle register will just drop down into the lower register because there's no way to distinguish it without proper embouchure. And since you're not using a proper embouchure, since you want air versus full sound, um, you won't really be able to get the mid register, so C5 to C6-ish. Um, you can get the high notes, but I really recommend it staying in the low notes just because it's easier and it will sound better. 
Um, but that is something to work well with a flutist if you're interested in having it go higher. The last version of the air sounds is mixed air and pitch. These can sound like this. And I prefer to see them notated like this. As you can probably hear, there's a bunch of different variables of how much air and how much sound. Well, the half-filled circle is a great imp indication that you want a mix. I do also highly recommend putting a percentage of like 80% air, 20% sound, 50-50, whatever it is that you want, so that the flutist really has an idea of which voice is more dominant or whether they should be properly mixed. Uh, this technique can go through the entire range of the flute, though it is harder at higher rate registers. You need a different airspeed to get those notes to speak, and sometimes they can drop down if you don't have enough airspeed and air pressure happening, which can happen if you're venting air to create air sounds. Um, it's a pretty versatile technique. The next one is one that I really should have covered in the first video, but apparently I just totally forgot, and that is harmonics. They sound like this. And I prefer to see them notated like this. The big thing that I most notice with harmonics is that you either can leave the fundamental pitch up to the performer or you can dictate the fundamental. Um, obviously it goes through the harmonic series and you can figure out which fundamentals will create which pitches. Well, you can hear there's some differences in timbre and also tuning because of where each pitch is in its own harmonic series. Uh, if you don't really care about that, then leave it up to the performer because it will be way easier for them. Um, sometimes these harmonics are in really, really difficult partials if you dictate the fundamental, and while you might really be aiming for that sound, it might not be worth it for the performer because they really just can't hit that note. It's very true for the high harmonics, like anything above G6 uh, gets really, really difficult to play on the low partials. Um, so if you're asking for the performer to hit a fourth or fifth partial harmonic, give them a break. <laughs> um, if you do really have a need for that very specific timbre, which is entirely fair and you should use it if you do want to, do, just keep in mind that you can create more difficulty for the performer and it's something that you do have to keep in mind and do have to work out with a performer of whether they can hit it and or not. Um, they're very versatile sounds. Uh, we, there's really nice ways to do timbral trills uh, between harmonics. That's really the basics of harmonics. They're not that hard. Um, that's why I shouldn't have talked about, I should have talked about them in the other video. <laughs> Next, we have multiphonics. And multiphonics are interesting. There are two types. There's natural harmonics, which use traditional fingerings. They sound like this. I'd like to see them notated like this. For these, you can hear I'm struggling, and obviously I've been practicing these for years. Um, they're very, very difficult because they use normal flute fingerings. And one, our embouchures are trained to produce the sound that you're fingering. And two, the flute just doesn't want to speak between notes. It is built to not do that. <laughs> Um, there are some that are really, really stable. The first one that you heard is a fingering for a high D and you just drop down the partial and it works 
perfectly. It's beautiful. I love that one. Um, but there's so many, if, if you know Robert Dick's book, The Other Flute, uh, there's a ton where he, the fingerings are just a traditional pitch and you have to aim in the middle and it's a very difficult thing to do. So while they have beautiful sounds and you can get some really interesting intervals, be very, very careful with these just because sometimes they're not going to speak. And especially if you're not giving the sound a time, time to develop and you just want that sound immediately, it's going to be very, very difficult for the performer. And again, these are all things that you can ask a performer to do, but it's something to keep in mind that is very difficult. The other type of multiphonic is artificial. So using altered fingerings. They can sound like this. And I'd prefer to see them notated like this. Note, with this one, there are always fingerings. Please give fingerings. I understand that composers don't want to format the fingerings. I get that it's hard and I get that your software doesn't like to do this, but it is incredibly important for the flutist because we don't know what resource you are using and they're different. If you look at Robert Dick's book, his fingerings for certain pitches are going to be different than some of the other resources that are available. And if you use something like the virtual flute, which is a great resource, I, it can be a fingering that just isn't logical to us and we might not be able to reproduce. Um, I remember seeing pieces for the first time that had no fingerings from Multiphonics and having to use the virtual flute to try to find something that resembled it. And it turns out that I was using the wrong fingering because Virtual Flute popped out a different fingering that didn't work exactly right. Uh, so wherever you find these multiphonics, please, please, please give us the fingerings. Even if you just link the resource or give a chart in the beginning, anything that has, that has a multiphonic should have a fingering with it, unless it is a natural multiphonic, in which case I'm okay without a fingering. Um, it also helps you distinguish between a natural and an artificial multiphonic because if they don't have fingerings then you know oh okay you just finger the bass note and do that um but it's actually good practice to give them for everything um because we'll see the fingering and go oh okay that's f i just have to figure out how to get a multiphonic to speak there uh so it can also be helpful to give them for the natural multiphonics but it isn't completely necessary uh, the artificial multiphonics are a lot more stable and a lot easier to produce because they're built to create that sound. Um, you might not always get the same intervals and pitches that you're expecting because each instrument is different uh, and because each player is different, but you'll get close if you give the fingering and you can always adjust if it's not a sound that you like and if the performer is having difficulty producing it, you can always adjust that as well. Um, that's also a thing. Sometimes people don't have a lot of luck with certain fingerings and it's always good to work with your performer, obviously, and try to find something that does work. Keep in mind that also that these fingerings are unusual. So if you're putting them intermixed with normal fingerings, normal notes, or you're expecting the players to move through them quickly, that you're asking a lot just because these are not traditional fingerings that we've practiced a lot, and sometimes they involve finger crossing or putting down multiple keys with one finger. So just keep that in mind that you're asking for weird stuff, which is valuable weird stuff, but can create a lot of problems for the performer. And the last set of techniques we're gonna talk about are altered singing and playing techniques. I talked about singing and playing in the first video, and I've also made the contemporary techniques videos for it. Uh, and that's just the basic like voice and flute. With this one, I'm gonna talk about a couple different things. Uh, the first one is phonetically altered singing and playing. It sounds like this.
like to see it notated like this. So with this, you're asking the flutist to change their mouth shape while singing so that the phonetic shape of their mouth alters the vocal pitch. It's true with singers, you can do that as well. Um, this just adds flute sound in. It's really the same thing. Uh, you just have to realize that the flutist is building an embouchure as well. So it's not always gonna be as clear as it would be with just vocal tone. Um, I've had people ask me about full words. I think it's better to just go with the vowel sounds and ask you to change the vowel sounds or even just like like a ch or a very distinctive mouth shape is better than the words themselves because it gives the flutist something to focus on other than the word and trying to figure out what word um i find it it feels like you're talking and you break your flute tone a little bit more so straight up phonetic alphabet with a key is way way better at least to me. With this, I think it's just a level of comfort level with singing that's required. Um, it's not really that difficult once you kind of get your head around the fact that you're adjusting your mouth shape, which is something that flutists are not supposed to do. Um, but yeah, it can be the range of the flute and you can really do anything with it. Just Keep in mind that sometimes it's not going to have a super huge effect just because your embouchure is still distorting the mouth shape. The other sound that I want to talk about is very harsh grunting singing and playing. These sound like this. And I like to see them notated like this. So this is, instead of having like a true vocal sound or like a singing, you're growling um, while playing flute and getting pitch. Um, they're almost percussive hits. You can extend them obviously, um, but I don't think they sound as interesting, but that is again, personal opinion that you can do what you want. Um, with this, again, entire range of the flute, uh, easier on low notes and high notes because middle range uh, you can, again, break down into the lower range or hit a harmonic uh, if you want that. Cool. Great. Um, I recommend with these, give the flutist a pitch and kind of a sound that you want, like a grunt or a grr or whatever it is, uh, and then see what sound you actually get produced. Because sometimes it just doesn't work out, or sometimes it's not aggressive enough, or it is too aggressive. Um, and don't be super attached to any of that because it is a very aggressive, very visceral thing that you have to do. And sometimes it gets a little bit out of control, especially if you get very into it. <laughs> I hope this video was helpful and I hope that I covered more of the techniques that you guys are interested in. If there's any that I missed, please let me know. And if you guys are interested in the Scary You Know video, I'll probably make it anyway, but please let me know if that's something you guys want. Uh, if you notice any techniques that I'm missing the individual videos on and you want me to do that sooner rather than later, please let me know. I'm always very happy to film what you guys want rather than what I feel like doing. Um, and as always, if you like this video, give it a like. If you're new here, please subscribe. If you want to support me more, check out my Patreon and I will see you guys very soon. Circle notation is great for implying that you're mixing. I do also recommend putting a percentage of like... Okay, um, so they're not always going to be as clear as it would be with just vo vocal toy. Vocal toy? I think someone got stuck in the elevator. Hope you can't hear that. <laughs>